and welcome to another episode of the Heartland Franchise Guide, your insider's guide to all things franchising in the local area. I'm Blake Martin, local small business franchise owner and your Heartland Franchise Guide. This is the place for advocacy, resources, and education on all things franchising in the local area and a great place for entrepreneurs to stop by when they're just looking to learn more about the franchising and small business industry. Today's episode is a unique one. Many of you know, if you're regular listeners, that this podcast is powered by FranNet of the Heartland. Today's episode is one on a topic that impacts all of us globally. It's an international topic, and we are part of an international organization. So you may be listening to this podcast as it's being delivered from any of your local FranNet offices throughout North America. Wherever you call home, we thank you for joining us today and hope you find real value in what we're covering. And what we're covering is a very important topic. We are going to touch on the R word today. Yep, that's right. We're going there. Our speaker today, our guest today, is Jim Canfield, an author, a public speaker, economic advisor, and a mentor to hundreds of CEOs and business leaders around the world. Jim, thank you so much for joining us today. Absolutely my pleasure. We appreciate it. We know a moment in time like this, the the draws on your time become even more important. So we truly appreciate you dedicating a little bit of time to us today. Let's set the table a little bit and then go more into our discussion items. Depending on how you measure it, it's been a good 13 years since we've been in a formal recession. That's about double the typical six to eight year cycle for an economic downturn that we've seen since World War II. So that's a tribute to the relative strength that we've seen in our global and national economies over the recent history of economic times. And it's also enough time that's been passed, and it makes a lot of sense to have a refresher on how to respond to it. That's why we've got Jim here with us today. Think about it. Professionals and entrepreneurs who've been in business ownership and business in general for 12 years or less haven't really seen a period like this. Of, of course, you can make an exception for the anomaly that we experienced in 2020 plus uh, for the event-driven pandemic downturn. But outside of that, it's been a while and it makes sense that we have this discussion again. Also on a topic this important, you have to scrutinize the sources of information through which you make big decisions about business. So I'm going to be a little bit more specific about Jim's bio, and he'll just have to deal with it if it embarrasses him a little bit. He has decades of experience as a strategic facilitator and coach for more than 300 CEOs and business leaders around the world. He served as a CEO of Renaissance Executive Forums, which is a leading membership organization for CEOs around the world. He's been the chief learning officer for Vistage, the world's largest CEO organization, by the way, Speaker of the Year for the Vistage organization. Jim is a graduate of the Fogelman School of Business at the University of Memphis. And after graduating from the Institute for Executive Leadership, he was the leader of the Institute at Rhodes for almost a decade. And a thought leader and advisor to the International Franchise Association for a long time such as being a keynote speaker and workshop facilitator for little organizations like McDonald's. You're not going to find Jim on TV ads or Facebook ads. But put simply, when Fortune 100 leaders are seeking advice, counsel, and a look into the future, Jim is on the very short list of people they reach out to. So again, I want to thank you for being with us today, Jim, and thank you for bearing with me through that more extended bio. It's my honor. I'm going to jump right into it. What officially defines if and when we enter a recession? Yeah, boy, we could spend the rest of our time uh, debating that one. But most generally speaking, I'll say it's multiple periods 
of negative growth. In other words, growth has gone below what would be a zero baseline, and we're actually seeing a contraction or negative growth is the way it's typically expressed. Many people think it's two quarters. Some people say three. Uh, I think this time around, there's going to be such sensitivity to using this word that probably a quarter or two is going to have people make the decision that we are, in fact, in a recessionary cycle. Yeah. And so we are entering a recessionary cycle? You know, I, I don't know. And even if we do move into a period, I, let, me, let me step back. As you already noted, we have had the longest period of expansion that we've had post-World War II. Right. And you attributed it to one thing, which is a robust economy. We have had a very strong economic uh, revitalization and then revival after the 2008 downturn. However, there's another factor that cannot be overlooked. This economy has been pumped up over and over by specific monetary policies that we could debate whether it was the right thing to do or not, but they were, those choices were made. There has been a lot of money through quantitative easing by the Fed and subsequently by stimulus packages that were more decided on the political landscapes that have definitely, if not created these last periods of growth, certainly stimulated it. And when we get that kind of external stimulus, something has to happen to it. And in the best case, it will, we might ease into a slowing growth cycle, which is always the predecessor to an actual recession. Growth slows, or growth happens at a slower and slower rate. We're still growing, but just at a slower rate. One of two things happens after that. A soft landing, this is where the economy moves to a zero or near zero growth rate, mm -hmm. but doesn't slip into multiple periods of negative growth. Or a full-on recession is where we go into a deeper negative growth cycle. I would have told you a month ago that I was more in the camp of a soft landing, you know, maybe a slight dip into the negative growth cycle, but I'm becoming more and more um, negative in my view, only because I think the Fed has, may have painted themselves into a bit of a corner here. They want to keep tightening. Uh, inflation is certainly more of a factor than, than most have, have expected, even though some of the Fed Members are saying they didn't anticipate inflation being quite this aggressive mm -hmm. and certainly some choices and some political uh, choices and some events around the world have impacted that. Um, so as a result, I think the Fed is painting themselves in a corner in this way. They want to tighten to address inflation, and they're deathly afraid that if they tighten too much too quickly, that we'll fall into those negative growth rates. I'm worried that in the very short term, like within a quarter, the Fed may try and do something that is very difficult, which is to add money to the economy at the same time they're tightening. This is very, very risky. It, it really risks throwing us into um, a cycle that we have not, not seen in the United States in a long time. We see it in other countries around the world, the Brazils and the Argentinas of the world, where all of a sudden the Fed has lost control of inflation and we could see 10, 15, even 20% inflation rates if this uh, pumping of the money into the economy is done in a way that um, that allows it without any controls around it. So I'm a little bit more negative today than I was even a week or two ago because I'm feeling more and more that the Fed has uh, has really lost control. Okay. And at, you know, having been through a number of these myself throughout my career, uh, even though I'm only 29 years old, <laughs> It, uh, it does remind your comments there at the end remind me one of the hallmarks is, you know, just the it, it's hard to know. Right. Things seem to change pretty rapidly as we're as we're entering a period like this. Yes, it, that's very true. And I've been through a few of these cycles. Look, I remember in the 80s when um, when home mortgages were above 15 percent. I mean, that seems incredulous to us today because we've had such a long period of low interest rates. But these cycles can go very wide and, and can uh, generate um, significantly higher rates than we've seen in recent history. And I think this will could be a wake up call for a lot of people. We also remember have, have a unique uh, characteristic that's happening today. Credit card debt is a little high, is a lot higher today than it was, say, back in the 80s. Uh, we people just carry bigger balances because rates have been so low. It hadn't hasn't really been a factor. If all of a sudden those rates were to rise dramatically, we might find 
a higher default level um, in addition to some of the things you'd probably guess like slower home purchases and and certainly no refinancings. So let's talk about uh, the practical impact and practical implications for business owners or aspiring business owners right now. You know, obviously, this isn't the first time we've dealt with economic change, eco- economic challenges in the history of business ownership. Based upon your experiences and the outcomes, what questions should business owners, business leaders be asking themselves and their key advisors and stakeholders right now? Given the context. You know, one of the we're, yeah, one of the things we're recommending right now, Blake, is a very hard reset a big debrief at the beginning of the second half of the year. That's tomorrow, July 1st. July 1st will signify the second six months of this year. Mm -hmm. I would not treat this as if it's the second month of the uh, second six months of the year. I would almost treat it like this is a new period and look at all of the strategies and tactics that we put in place earlier and really thinking, will those carry me through to the end of the year, achieving the results that we'd like to see? Really a hard reset. I mean, the way I look at this, is this is like a college football coach who's on the sidelines. There, he's looking, the coach is looking up at the scoreboard as the seconds of that first half tick down, four, three, two. When he looks up at the scoreboard, there's one of only two circumstances. He's either ahead or he's behind. In the case of being ahead, he's going to go into the locker room saying, look, a lot of things worked in the first half, but there's still some things we can do better. If he's behind, he's going to go into the locker room and say, look, there are a lot of things we need to do differently in the second half to really achieve what we want to achieve, which is a win on the scoreboard. The only thing I'm absolutely sure of is none of those coaches, none, no coach is going to go into the locker room and say, I don't need to say anything to this team. They know what to do. This is where leaders step up and they point their teams in the right direction. Things I would be looking at at this point, Blake, pricing. How has inflation impacted the your cost structure and how do you need to adjust your pricing to make sure that you're protecting margins going into the second half of the year, assuming at this stage, at least I would be assuming at this stage that inflation will continue, maybe even accelerate and making those pricing changes needed. Last year, the companies that I saw who were aggressive in making price increases did great at the end of last year. I'm beginning to see those same results in the first half of this year. The ones who fail to make aggressive price changes are really struggling with margins and therefore profitability. I'd be looking at products. Which products or services do we offer that might best fit our customer base at this time? When we say do a hard reset, what we're saying is scan the landscape. You know, look across the horizon. What's changed? What's going on with our customers? How have the current economic conditions impacted our customers? How are their habits changing, their philosophies, their thoughts? What do they what do they need more of, less of, or different at, in this environment versus what we've seen over the last decade or so? Look at your competitors. How are they faring? What are they doing with their pricing? Are there new competitors who have entered the, the fray? And how do they impact us? I'd like to look at our overall industry. What's happening there? Our overall marketplace? even how the economy is impacting us. And when we scan that horizon, we're asking the question, what's changed? As changes are inevitable, and now what do we need to do differently moving forward? And I'm looking at four factors. How do we drive revenue? Increasing sales, even in a declining environment. It's gonna be tougher. What do we do? How do we protect margin? Making sure that we're making money on every sale that we make or any revenue dollar that we generate. Number three, how do we protect net profit? That may mean controlling expenses much more aggressively than we have in the past. And last, how does all that impact the value of my business? How do I make sure that my business is growing in terms of its value over these next months and quarters and even years? I appreciate the very specific, actionable detail there. Thank you. As you were walking through some of those leadership decisions, it made me think a little bit about um, your background and experience. You've been actively involved in the franchising community. Of course, this is the Heartland Franchise Guy uh, podcast. Why is it, in your opinion, that the franchising industry, in many cases, statistically speaking, tends to fare better 
when we're entering downturns like this? I think that's a great question. And here's a couple of things that I see. Number one, there's an old adage about CEOs and business owners that says it's lonely at the top. It's lonely at the top. And, and for a long time, I believed that to be true, Blake. And then I realized I take a little different take on it. I don't think it's so lonely at the top, yet there is a sense of being alone at the top. Oftentimes, I'm the only one thinking about my business. I'm All the decisions end with me. It's up to me to set the direction and then get the team to execute to deliver against that. And I think one of the benefits of being in a franchise system is while I may be alone in my own business, I can tap into a network of other business owners who are doing the same thing that I do. And the way I always see it is in a franchise system, there's always somebody else who's just doing it a little bit better. Maybe they're just a few chapters ahead in the book. They may have been out there a little longer, been a little more successful. There's a learning system that's inherently available inside of a franchise system that other single unit business owners simply don't have access to, except maybe a peer group. But even then, they're not all in the same business. And there's a real strength in being able to tap into the knowledge network that a franchise system can provide. Also, we've got the backing of the franchisor, who in many cases is a much larger organization, and they're able to look at some of these trends, like economic trends and competitive trending, maybe even customer and uh, satisfaction and service levels to, to be able to make recommendations to all of us in a franchise system as to what we might do next. So I think it's this adage that all of us are smarter than any of us. All of us are smarter than any of us and being able to tap into a network of really smart and motivated business people can be such an advantage, especially when things are going to be a little tougher. I'm 100% stealing that from you. All of us are smarter than any of us. Thank you very much. <laughs> Might have to rewind our own podcast episode here to make sure I get that one right. On that topic of, uh, you know, I'll say silver linings, right? Silver linings to um, potential clouds at certain periods of time. There, there may very well be, as there is in economic downturns, there may very well be downsizings and layoffs, right? Uh, at least in particular regions and in particular categories. That sometimes creates opportunities for people to take a little bit more control over getting into a more secure industry or role, including doing so by starting their own thing, which begs the question of somebody with your background. If you were in a position at a time that might come around to us during an economic downturn, during a recession, if you were in a position to choose a more secure industry and start your own business, what kind of businesses would you be looking at at a time like this? Yeah, great question. Actually, I want to step back one step from that question and just say to people who might be thinking about, or maybe they have had a situation that requires them to think about what kind of business to be in. Oftentimes, the first question they ask is, is this a good time? I mean, if we're moving into a slowdown or maybe even a recession, you know, almost sounds counterintuitive to say this is the best possible time to build a business. And I'm going to tell you, it's the best possible time to build a business. In other words, think about it. Every adage around investment that you've ever read says what? Buy low, sell high. Well, starting a business during a slowdown, while it may be difficult, maybe maybe harder, you're at the bottom of the cycle. So you get to ride the next economic cycle of growth. People who, who um, may look at building a business or buying a business when the cycle is well underway, typically it costs more and it's more difficult to find those opportunities. This is a great time to do that. I'd be looking at businesses that provide either basic services or services that people require, maybe even want more of during periods of slowdowns. Um, I'd be looking at anything that is resistant to price decreases. So in other words, things I can, I can raise my prices on and people will still buy. There's a the level of price resilience to what I do. Um, I think just generally speaking, the franchising would be a great thing to look at now for all the reasons we just discussed that you've got a support system to help build and grow that business as things are in a slower economic cycle. And then you'll be able to ride that curve straight up into the next growth cycle, which we will see. Uh, I think it'll happen relatively quickly in the next year, two or two years or so. We're going to see that growth cycle again. 
Um, and we won't see another downturn until you know, later in the 2020s, maybe even 2030. So this next cycle will be another one of these nice long growth cycles. And what better way to do it than building value in your own business instead of yet again providing wealth for someone else? Thank you. Appreciate that. As we start to wrap up here on our time, I also wanted to throw out there anything else that you think we should be considering right now? And we, as our listeners, prospective or existing business owners primarily. Yeah, it's interesting. I was talking to someone just earlier this week um, about business ownership in general and, and specifically a business that they were thinking about. And one of the things that I thought and talked to them about is if you had dollars available to you right now, where would you put them? You know, certainly if you look at the stock market, that feels a little risky. The bond market certainly will, was going to have some challenges over the next years as rates move up and down and inflation becomes an issue. You know, there's just not a safe haven out there, really. And yet, if I'm going to bet on something, I'd always rather bet on myself. So in this case, I think I'd rather be starting a business and putting my money to build something that would be valuable to me and my family, not only today, but maybe for generations to come. And so right now, I would say if I was making a decision like this to buy, build or run a business, start a business at this stage, perfect timing. Not going to be easy, but perfect timing. Okay. Thank you. Appreciate that perspective. Jim Canfield, how can people get a hold of you if they want to learn more? I'm easy to find on LinkedIn, Jim Canfield at CEO Tools. And my email address is jim.canfield at ceotools.com. And the website's pretty easy, ceotools.com. And your last name spelled just how it sounds, C-A-N-F-I-E-L-D. Yes. Great. Thank you. Jim, thank you so much. Again, I realize at times like this, uh, your time is even thinner uh, to dedicate to things like this. So I really appreciate you taking some time, sharing your thoughts and advice with our listeners. Well, you know, I'm a big fan of, of FranNet and anything I can do to support FranNet and all of its communities, I'm always going to be there for you. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. We are about building communities, one local small business at a time. And thanks to all of you for joining us on another episode of the Heartland Franchise Guy. Remember, don't keep us a secret. Subscribe, follow, and share our episodes, particularly an episode like this with Jim Canfield of CEO Tools, when you see somebody who could gain value and benefit from the information that you've heard today. We thank you all for being with us. Thanks again to Jim Canfield and hope you all have a wonderful day. We'll see you again on another episode of the Heartland Franchise Guide.